Good morning. Derek Watson here, the angry dentist. Another lovely day in paradise. Another rainy day in paradise. I don't know what I did to deserve this. Somebody really, really good must have died in 1959 to have got me here. Anyway, I was going to talk about technicians today, but actually I, uh, I changed my mind because I need to uh, just formulate my thoughts on technicians a little bit. Well, I could do. I mean, I can ramp on <laughs> on almost any subject really <laughs> for 20 minutes, which is the general idea. A couple of thoughts, though. Um, you know, this uh, madness, NHS madness, is increasing. It's, uh, you wouldn't think that uh, you could turn the volume up to 11, would you, on the NHS Madness, but they've managed to. Um, we've got uh, reports coming in of uh, teeth being root filled one root at a time so that you can claim for three root treatments on a molar. Uh, one of my favourites is a local a commissioning authority that penalised the dentist for exceeding their target, the UDA target. And, and what happens if you go over your UDA target, I think they allow you a 4% tolerance. But that's sort of permissive. If you don't, uh, you know, if they don't want to allow you to, then they don't have to. So um, this particular dentist went over a target and, um, and so uh, they refused to pay her for the work that, they, that she'd done. And the other thing that they do, which you may not know, is that because you shouldn't have done the work and yet you have taken the patient's charges for this work, they insist that you pay the patient's charges back. So not only have you done the work, you have to pay them for the privilege of having done the work and not got paid for it. So, <laughs> so <laughs> it's just, you couldn't make this up. I mean, you know, these people are unfit for purpose. They really are. This is what happens when you try and... Uh, what, what was the word someone said the other day the age of we're in the age of supervision or something or you know you know everyone's being micromanaged from the center and it just doesn't work another um, under the law of unintended consequences uh, someone um, a dentist gave up uh, practicing in 2010 went into partnership with her uh, with her daughter, her daughter's a registrant, she's a registrant, she's non-practicing, and then um, thought that uh, because she was non-practicing she didn't need to do any CPD, so now she's come to the end of her CPD cycle, um, she then didn't bother submitting the CPD records to the GDC because she, you know, she thought that they didn't really want to know about that. And they then asked her to produce all the certificates and of course she hasn't got any for the last six years and so um, the chances are she's going to be removed from the register which is sort of a technical as you say she's non-practicing dentist so you can say well you know okay so that's a technical thing but in fact there's a sort of a, there's a difference between partnerships and limited companies in this respect in that a partnership this is this advice is from uh, Sunil Abawikrami who is our uh, lawyer who does give um, free advice to members and, uh, and and can be engaged to work at reasonably high level on these things because he is the guy who's you know the go-to guy for this sort of knowledge and apparently all the partners in a partnership have to be registrants whereas only one director in a limited company that operates a dental practice needs to be a registrant therefore if one of the partners is removed from the register then effectively that partnership becomes ineligible to hold a contract and uh, therefore the, uh, that, that, that partnership will then have to approach the GDC and see whether, uh, not the GDC sorry, the, the commissioning authorities, the PCT, to see whether they would be agreeable to the contract just changing from you know basically to the two dentists to perhaps the one dentist or something. Well, technically, that's a change of legal entity, and the PCT, if they're going, you know, they're being awkward. And the previous chief dental officer, Barry Cockroft, gave them the the authority to be as awkward as they liked, you know, and to really get the license to cop the system up at will. Um, 
and if they want to be awkward and say it's a change of legal entity and then the whole thing needs to go out to tender, then that's how a simple failure, a simple misinterpretation of the rules regarding CPD has led to the loss of an NHS contract. So we're hoping it doesn't get to that point and we put Sonia in touch with that member who's and, uh, she's now got that advice and is now considering what to do about it. But um, it wasn't possible to scrape together enough CPD to satisfy it. So anyway, um, I want to talk about third party capitation because it's a nice little subject. The, the history of third party capitation, which is basically firms like Denplan, DPAS, Practice Plan, etc. Although Practice Plan was bought out, oh, by, is it by Wesleyan? And then I think Wesleyan has just literally bought DPAS as well. So there's a lot of consolidation in the um, third party dental plan world. The history of it was that it was originally invented by two dentists, uh, Stephen Knorr and Marilyn Orcherton. And together they came up with this idea, which was that it was quite revolutionary at the time, which is that supposing you've got a, your, the cost of running your surgery is £100,000 a year and uh, you've got a thousand patients, why don't you just charge them £100 each? Hey presto, £100,000. Uh, you know, no need to worry about the NHS, no need to worry about fee for item, etc, etc. Well, uh, it was revolutionary, as I say, and they went they went on the stump up and down the country telling everyone about it. And uh, It was basically one of these, you could either see it or you couldn't. And a lot of people were very critical and there, there's a few nuances. For example, you can't really charge everybody £100 because some people will need far more work than than others. And so they it was expanded according to risk, where E is a dental disaster and A is a, someone, a child, for example, who's got very few fillings or no no fillings and healthy gums. So it's got five bands, unlike the NHS, which, thanks to Harry Idiot Clayton, decided on three bands. Three bands is not sufficient. Five bands is sufficient. In fact, if they just expanded UDAs to five bands fairly early on, I don't think we'd have half the trouble that we've got at the moment. But... Um, uh, they needed, they went, uh, Clayton wanted to keep it simple for the patients. He didn't think patients could understand five prices for dentistry, although they seem to understand 5,000 prices when they go down Tesco, but somehow five prices for dentistry was, was too much for the patients' brains, according to Clayton, Clayton whatever his idiot name was. Anyway, um, so it's banded according to risk. And it's not subjective, it's objective. It's literally done on uh, how many fillings, crowns, bridges, etc., dentures that you've got on a points-based system. And the reason why it works is that like the stock market, or unlike the stock market, where past performance is no indicator of future activity, uh, in dentistry, past performance is an indicator. And so if you're, you know, whatever age, and you've got, uh, you've got 10 crowns, two bridges, and six root treatments already, chances are you're going to need another crown or a root treatment uh, whereas if you've got you got you know into adulthood without any fillings then chances are that's how you're going to stay so it's a very good system there's a bit of subjectivity on the assessment of the gums but really not much you know not usually not enough to jump you up or down a band so um, anyway uh, the, those of us who saw it got into it quite uh, early and I was uh, the first uh, regional one of the very first two dentist I think that they employed I was the southern regional inspector used to go around mainly dealing with insurance claims um, because there's an element of insurance in it although it's actually it's not an insurance scheme now the good thing about it is it's um, it's a shared saving scheme and this is what we keep arguing you know the NHS should adopt a system where dentists are paid a fixed amount and if they get the patients healthy and save money then they get to keep uh, uh, all, or, all or most of the money the difference between uh, third party capitation and NHS capitation is in NHS capitation the uh, state sets the fee and so you, it's a recipe for supervised neglect because uh, they might set it at a fee which is less than the cost of doing the work. On the third party schemes the, um, the dentist sets the fee so and he will set it at a level that he can do the work therefore the incentives are all changed around so if um, if a dentist doesn't do a filling on a third party capitation scheme then all, all that's going to happen is that uh, it's going to get bigger and he's just going to end up in six months time having to do the same filling only only bigger and so there's a very powerful um, 
incentive both to make the patient healthy and um, uh, and also to do work early you know not not to leave it late now the first variation on that pure sort of third-party capitation came when um, the the dentists I think were in, in a way they were sort of they were almost like too greedy they would have they would have their thousand patients paying them a hundred pounds a year so that they'd be getting like uh, eight or nine thousand pounds a month coming in and believe me if you've only got a thousand patients and uh, you don't uh, you know for the most part they're dentally fit it doesn't actually cost eight or nine thousand pounds a month to look after them or it didn't uh, obviously these are all sort of 1985 figures uh, and also the scheme doesn't cover anything that you buy in so if you take a patient on based on their risk but if they come in and say actually I've started playing rugby I need a mouth guard then um, you haven't costed that mouth guard into you know your sums therefore you are entitled to say to them look I'm gonna have to buy that in therefore I'm I'm gonna take the impressions and fit it for you and, and do the adjustments for you because that is costed in I have costed in enough surgery time to be able to look after you but I haven't costed in the cost of buying in stuff from outside so they pay for the mouth guard at cost price it's a good deal for them um, and it means you're no worse off you know you don't suffer financially if someone comes in and says um, I need a, a mouth guard or something um, and it's the same with crowns and bridges you uh, do all the preparation and the fit and everything but they pay the lab charge now dentists started taking liberty with what they were charging that they weren't happy to have eight or nine thousand pound a month coming in for not much uh, work they decided to um, they, you know there was this little sort of area of uncertainty where they could say to the patient oh yeah actually all oh, my my lab's very expensive he charges 500 quid and so the whole thing in my opinion it, you know there was a there was a bit of I wouldn't say abuse but in the end they said look you know you can't charge although because there were two groups of dentists those that sort of charge say I'll, I'll charge I'll give you two-thirds off because it's a crown so let's say for the sake of argument that a crown was 540 they would say to the patient well I'll charge you 180 a third and the reason why they said that was because usually the lab bill was less than a third but they didn't want to charge the the 60 quid or whatever they were paying for, for the crown so they said oh well I'll, I'll do it for a third or and there were some like me who literally just gave the lab bill to the patient and said look this is what I've had to pay you settle it on the way down because I've already paid this or I'm gonna have to pay this uh, and the patients appreciated that because they could see that you weren't sort of profiteering off them um, anyway um, the uh, the main objection really amongst the people who didn't really understand the scheme was that why bother uh, paying monthly for dentistry why don't you just pay because it, surely it's going to work out cheaper you know surely it's going to be why pay sort of 20 pounds a month uh, pay 240 quid when you know a checkup two checkups and two scale and polishes uh, might come to a bit slightly more or slightly less or whatever in other words why not just underwrite yourself and of course that's what most patients are used to doing isn't it they underwrite themselves they go along and if anything's wrong then fine but I think they missed the point of the plan and the whole point of the plan is this it it transfers the responsibility for keeping the patient healthy from the patient to the dentist now it doesn't it doesn't entirely transfer it because you could say well okay then the patient doesn't have to brush their teeth and you know as long as they pay their monthly fee they don't you know they can just neglect their mouth and, and it's down to the dentist if anything goes wrong and that's not true there, there is the patient does have a responsibility to do to maintain their teeth and if they don't then they might find themselves jumping up a band if their gums deteriorate so they there's a financial penalty for not looking after their not brushing their teeth and secondly uh, you can take them off the scheme if they are obviously have no intention at all of trying to stay healthy then um, you don't have to keep them on the scheme you just say look I think you'd be better off on a pay-as-you-go basis because you're you know I can't uh, you know every time you come in here you um, you've, uh, you're obviously not taking any notice of my advice on diet and brushing and so, so I don't think I can help you so anyway the, this sort of a bastardized hybrid version 
sprung up, which is the version where um, the, the stuff that you know you're going to do, or the patient knows that you're going to do, two checkups, two scan and polishes a year, which is what most patients will accept that, you know, that every year they're going to have that anyway. What they did was they said, well, why don't we, we just include that? So in other words, have no element in the monthly fee for any work that might, any fillings, grounds, bridges or anything, just do an ultra, ultra low monthly subscription that just covers me for um, the checkup and scale and polish. But if I need anything like a filling or something, then I'll pay for it uh, or I'll get a 10% reduction. And that's usually how it works. It's free checkups, free scale and polishes and a reduction on the cost of treatment. Now, the, the, there's several problems with this. First is that the dentist immediately puts his fees up to compensate for the 10% that he's, he's giving people off. And you find this with finance schemes as well. Uh, as soon as the uh, dentist offers finance, the finance company takes 6%. So you find that anyone who's quoted uh, finance uh, is quoted 6% on top to cover the cost of the finance. Um, and then, and then secondly, and the much, much bigger problem with it is that it, it takes the burden off the dentist and puts, back, it puts it back on the patient again. The patient is now underwriting their own treatment again. So you've got no incentive, really. You know, the, the incentive that the dentist had to keep you healthy is removed. He's now back to his old incentive, which is to make money by finding things wrong with your teeth and repeatedly finding things wrong with your teeth. And not at all worried about how long anything lasts because as long as he it lasts long enough for you to forget who did it um, then obviously he's going to get paid to do it again as and when it fails again now it's not quite the repeat cycle of uh, the, sort of the, the continuous fast turnover repeat restorative cheap re repeat restorative work that we used to get under the old fee for item system on the NHS but your dentist is no longer um, how can I put it? It's no longer incented to try and keep your uh, health as high as possible in, in order to maximise his profit. His profit is maximised by um, doing your scale and polishes as and when you ask for them and, um, and but again, having a good old look around your mouth to see what he can do for 90%. So that's why I've always been a big fan of a pure capitation scheme. I don't like these discount treatment schemes. I don't think they're good for the patient and patients and I don't think they're good for the dentist and I, they lull people into a full sense of security. Um, the other types of schemes you get, you sort of the, uh, I don't know, the, the ones where you sort of pay a monthly premium and like, like the, the pure insurance schemes where there is a third party insurer are, are worse and tend to be short lived and tend to collapse. And again, I think that's another important thing to remember with third-party capitation schemes like Denplan or uh, the Wesleyan stroke practice plans stroke DPAS is that they're, they're, although there's an element of insurance, so for example, if you get run over by a bus, you can make an insurance claim. Any sort of external trauma is covered by an insurance claim. If you need emergency treatment and you're, you're more than 15 miles away from the dentist, it's an insurance claim. But otherwise, it's all down to the dentist. And then that's how I explain it to the patients. I say, if the, uh, anything goes wrong, it comes out of our pocket, which gives us a, a very powerful incentive to make sure. And it literally does. I mean, I've just done a root treatment on someone. We just signed him up on the scheme. He came in and said that one of his teeth were aching. Um, we, we vitality tested it. It was dead as a dodo. Just had to do a, a root treatment on an upper right seven probably would have charged, I don't know, best part of three, four, four hundred quid for that. Um, but it's done free on the scheme. On an insurance scheme, then <clears throat> we would have been paid. However, the way insurance schemes work are, they come into the market, initially their fees are very low, they sign people up, there's an element of um, health uh, speculation, you know, in that only the sick people join, of course. I mean, why would you bother with a health insurance if you're, if you're young, fit and healthy? So um, people, who, people who know, even people who know that they need a lot of work doing can join these schemes because the way that they sort of try and discourage people who need work doing from joining is saying that you really can't claim for three months. 
Well, I'll tell you, for a patient, three months is nothing. It's nothing. Some of these people, right, have had sort of septic mouths for five, ten years. They're not they're, they're not going to balk at going down Tesco's, signing up for the Tesco's dental plan, and then just waiting three months. That's not a problem for them. And so what happens is the... Um, the population, you know, the cohort, the the, uh, the the group of patients on that plan, always end up being more unhealthy than the underwriters have assumed. And so what happens? Next year they put the fees up. So then um, uh, a few of the more healthy patients leave and only the unhealthy patients join. And so next year they put the fees up again. And then eventually the fees go up so much that um, there's no... You know, people start leaving. They're saying like this: my dental insurance has become so expensive that uh, I can no longer remain a member of it. And the people who've had all their dentistry done leave, and the people who've had no dentistry done leave, um, and so uh, they're just left with people joining and trying and drawing out more out of the scheme than they ever put in. So the whole thing collapses. And this is a well-known phenomenon. Now, by making the dentist responsible, um, uh, you know, the dentist is the gatekeeper and he's the gatekeeper to his own money in effect and this was the genius of, of Orchiton and Noah originally um, now should you incorporate it into your practice? I would say yes and why, why is that? Because one third of your patients will be what I call insurance minded two thirds of them won't and honestly you'll have some of the most pointless conversations with the ones who aren't trying to get them to see the light and they will never see the light and so what I do now is if someone is not insurance minded I literally say okay fair enough you would be better off on uh, pay as you go because you're, the, you, you're, you're a self underwriter um, if your boiler blows up you don't have insurance because you know that you can pay for a new boiler you know if your car breaks down you, you're not a member of the AA because you trust yourself to use a motorway phone and you know you're going to get fleeced to tow your car away but that's how you like it because you don't like the peace of mind that comes with knowing that there is somebody there to help you out and some of it is peace of mind you know I mean it's not that that, that that monthly premium is paying for peace of mind some people are a member of the AA and they do have insurance on their boiler and they will want some sort of scheme that um, that means that they can come along to the dentist as much as they like and um, and get uh, and get fixed up now that that will be about a third of your patients as I say and then and you occasionally you'll get a patient who'll join the scheme who'll then come back after a year and say look you know I don't know if the scheme's not really working for me because I've had my checkups and I've been to see the hygienist and everything but I um, I haven't had any fillings <laughs> so what am I why am I paying you you know 300 pound a year and I'm getting nothing done and so to those people I do say well uh, you know you're you wouldn't ring up the AA at the end of the year and say look I, look here AA you know I've um, I've been paying you all year and how many times have you towed me away? Never! <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me getting angry <laughs> yeah so you wouldn't ring up the AA and, and complain that you'd never been towed away would you? or ring up your uh, son the water and say that um, you know, I've got leak insurance, and how many leaks have you fixed? <laughs> you come around and fix a few leaks. But there are people like that, and then again, and then you have to say to them, look, you, you'd be better off on pay as you go. And they're never, they are never better off on pay as you go. Uh, not from the dental health point of view. They might be, in the short term, they might be financially better off, but I mean, from the dental health point of view, they do what every patient does on pay as you go. They're, they're, their health goes up when they come in, and then down for six months, and then up when they come in, and down for six months, and that's their choice anyway so a third of your pain don't let them tell you that all your patients will go on on a plan they won't about a third will but the third who do will will really really allow you to do some really excellent preventive dentistry and give you a nice nice little income stream that continues even while you're on holiday so um anyway that's uh, that's my subject for today and we'll see what we talk about tomorrow anyway have a good day bye